uh, good to see all of you. Uh, if you haven't joined one of these before, welcome. Uh, we run these every couple of months. And the idea is to bring together people who work in ML research with people using ML in production. Uh, I reckon the number of people using ML in production is probably like 10 times or something over the past year. Um, so I'm sure, you know, a lot of people will be very interested, uh, uh, nowadays, uh, just quickly to introduce myself. So I'm Gabriel, so I'm CTO of Bloop, uh, Bloop's a startup and we're building an AI developer assistant. Um, and we make very heavy use of large language models. Uh, so naturally we're very excited to welcome, uh, Noah Shin, um, Noah is an undergraduate student at Northeastern University and the lead author of what has to be one of the most influential LLM papers of the year, which is quite an achievement given quite how many LLM papers there have been this year. Um, and yeah, I mean, like as LLMs, you know, becoming more and more widely used for decision making and not just chat. Uh, and people are beginning to use LLM agents uh, in production. Uh, reflection is a word that lots of people have been talking about uh, and something that uh, Noah knows a lot about. Um, so Noah, love to just hand over to you. Um, I think you should be able to share your screen uh, if that works. And note that at the end, uh, we'll have time for Q&A. Um, so if you have questions, you know, stick them in the chat or, you know, we'll have, uh, we'll have some time uh, to run through those and get through as many as possible. Cool. Over to you, Noah. All right. Well, um, thank you for the, um, thank you for the invite and for the intro. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm Noah. I'm the lead author of a paper. We, we have two versions of the, of the paper now. So today I'm going to be presenting both versions. Um, but I assume that most in the audience uh, are um, interested in the code generation um, part of the paper. And so uh, this will be more of like a broad overview and then um, talk about code generation and then I'll open up to questions at the end. Um, and so this was work done with um, collaborators from Northeastern, MIT, and Princeton. Um, okay, so let's start with a short example. Um, I like to start with examples and uh, let, let's show what the driving idea behind this framework is. Okay, so we're given a task. Um, generate a sentence with 11 words. And so uh, this is a fairly easy task. Let's ask GPT to generate the completion. And so we get uh, some sort of generation. It looks right. It looks like it's 11 words. But then when we actually check the count, it is 10 words. Okay, and so what, what can we do from here? Do we, we, do we throw an error or do we say that it can't do this? Um, or is there more that we can do? Um, well, let's take the, the generation and let's ask, um, can you verbosely check if this actually has 11 words? And so when we do so, we see that it checks each word one by one. So one, the two sky, all the way to 10. And it sees, okay, there are 10 words in this completion. Um, I made a mistake and he, now here's a revision. Okay, so we're given this revision. It looks like it has 11 words. Let's actually check and it has 12. Okay, so once again, we can throw an error or maybe there's more that we can do about this. And so let's let's run this loop again and let's ask it to verbosely check its work. And then we see, okay, now it actually sees that it has 12 words, not 11, and it suggests another another generation. Okay, so this this as well looks like it has 11 words and it actually does have 11 words. Now we don't want to return here because um, we want the LLM to, in the same way that it identified its mistakes, we want it to identify its successes as well. So let's ask one more time. Uh, okay. Uh, verbosely check once once more. And yes, here we see it has 11 words. And now uh, this can be parsed if you were doing this autonomously. It could be parsed with um, like confidence in all caps or, or something like that, um, where you can get, um, you can stop at the at a right point. 
Okay, so here there's clearly um, there's clearly something here. There's a discrepancy between the ability for the same LLM to do evaluation versus generation. And so over the course of a generation, maybe uh, the LLM hallucinates. So how can we exploit this ability to do better evaluation um, to, to you know, assist generation in an autonomous manner? And so what's at the core here is that um, we need to dive more into uh, what sort of reasoning strategy is happening here. And so more, more explicitly, um, the LLMs are reasoning in language space. And so this is a slight subtlety here. Now, if I, I were to ask you as humans, what is 30,000 plus 50,000? You are immediately, 80,000 is the next, is the answer. Now, it's not the characters that build up 80,000. It is the semantic idea of the, of the number of the value 80,000. And so if I were to suggest 70,000, you wouldn't say, well, that is close, it's one character off. You would say, no, that's, that, that is the wrong answer. Okay, and so humans would give 80,000. But how about language models? What is 30,000 plus 50,000? Now the language model is not necessarily suggesting, okay, now it's 80,000, I know that. It is saying, okay, well, I know the num next character is an A. And then once more it's an eight zero, and then eight zero comma and so on and so on until we, until we get 80,000. And yes, the language model received, uh, arrived at the correct answer, but how did they arrive there? Well, it was autoregressively character by character. And so there's an issue here because um, one assumption we're making is that we're, we're reasoning in language space, um, meaning that we are conditioning on the past sequence to generate the next token. Okay, and there are all these, um, there are all these um, sort of compounded errors that, it, that can occur with this inference strategy. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about critique methods. Um, you can classify my, the first version of my paper, which was in March, as the critique paper, um, or there were uh, several other confounding works as well, um, as well as one prominent work from OpenAI that predated that paper. So let's talk about critique. You're given a completion or a generation. Let's critique that generation. And now given that critique, what can we do better for generation? Well, we can, we can close the loop and actually um, we can alter the, the generation uh, iteratively in the manner that makes the generation hopefully better over time. And so um, this work from OpenAI showed that in general, given the same model, a model is, is capable of generating a wrong completion, but it can still evaluate that completion more accurately than the generation itself. Okay, so what can we do uh, further uh, to build onto this? So we, given a more complex uh, task, how can we do better generation in a sense? Okay, so we're, we're, given, a, we're given a generation. And then we can generate a binary reward given that we can do a critique. So you can classify the critique as a zero one. Um, is this generation uh, correct or not correct? Okay, and so we get a binary reward. How, what can we do with this binary reward? Well, we can amplify the binary reward into a natural language reward. And why do we want to amplify this binary reward to natural language reward? Well, we'll get to that, that in the next slide. But as you can see here, we're doing this, we're, we're trying to maximize this reward in some sense. And so we can classify the model itself as the policy. So now we're doing, we're trying to maximize the reward on a given a, a given policy. And so we can close this loop here and uh, do better generation in general. But more explicitly, how do we go about this? So how do we do policy optimization in a cheap and effective way? Well, so here's a proposed algorithm for how to do so. So this is uh, an intro to verbal reinforcement learning. Okay, and so one subtle detail here is that um, Traditionally, the policy is parameterized by the weights of the model itself, so the actor. Um, but in order to do policy optimization in a cheaper and more effective way, we can re-parameterize the policy as 
the model as well as, as memory and natural language. So why are we adding the, why are we re-parameterizing in terms of the memory? Well, if that parameterizes the policy, then we can do policy optimization in natural language space, given that the memory is in natural language. So more explicitly, we have an actor, an evaluator, as well as a self-reflector. And we're, we initialize a policy initially, and we generate a, an initial trajectory. Now we can evaluate that, that trajectory, zero or one, using the evaluator. And then we can amplify that binary reward into natural language. Given that natural language reward, now we can optimize the policy in the memory space, in semantic space, in order to do to have a policy at this at inference time that can um, generate better completion stats, generate better rewards in semantic space. Okay, and there are various ways to terminate from this loop um, that I won't discuss here. Okay, so once again, we are re-parameterizing policy with uh, natural language memory. Okay, um, is that, okay, okay. Um, well, just to briefly rewind, um, here is a high-level description of, of our agent loop. So uh, we have a traditional environment. You can execute actions in the environment and you can observe observations. And from there, you can generate reward either from the environment or self-generated. And there's a concept of long-term memory that is, that is composed of natural language. And we can optimize that natural language long-term memory to influence an actor's decisions in order to do better generation in the next trial. Okay, and um, there was a great blog post um, from Noah Goodman that talked about meta prompting, which is um, sort of along the same lines. All right, so um, now let's let's talk about how can we practically um, use this approach to do better generation in general across a wide range of tasks. So first, decision making. How can we assist language models to do better planning, uh, reasoning over several steps? Okay, well, so we'll take the Alf world. Um, uh, benchmark, if you're not familiar with the auth world, uh, we're using the purely text version of auth world, which is a given a household task, the language model is tasked to generate a, a sequence of actions. And um, the success rate of that of that agent depends on whether, whether or not the task was completed within the given environment. Okay, so here in the bottom left, we have a brief overview of how we set this up using reflection. So we're given a task, we generate a trajectory. Then we evaluate that trajectory in some, some way, and I'll talk about that in, in a bit. And then we amplify that evaluation using self-reflection into a natural language reward. And then we close the loop and we, we repeat if the trajectory was failed. Okay, so in the top right, we see that this greatly influences a, an LLM, its ability to do better planning without fine-tuning um, the model itself at all. Okay, and so how do we generate this evaluation? This is a very subtle step. How do we generate evaluation um, given, a, um, given a, a trajectory? Well, there are two cases. One, we can use GPT itself. So we can simply ask, is this task completed or not? That's a zero or one binary reward output. Or we can design a heuristic, and this is what we did for the majority of the paper. Um, a heuristic that will count for, so it, it, it's a little bit simple, but um, if there are the same action and observation pairs um, for n number of steps, then that is hallucination um, over repetitive action. And if you execute too many actions within the same trajectory, well, then that's inefficient planning. So we want to penalize against that. However, uh, the GPT approach is, is more flexible because maybe uh, you can't do this sort of exact match counting or um, you can't design a heuristic in the given environment. Okay, so let's move to programming. So um, how can we apply this to programming? Well, programming is a somewhat easier task because we can, there's the concept of uh, unit test suite, which can be easily um, evaluated or executed 
um, to generate this binary reward that we need. Okay, so um, in the programming in the programming setup, we have an instruction or a, a natural language description of a function that we want. Then we implement that function, and we also implement we also generate a unit test suite um, for that for that function. Then we can execute the generated program on the unit test suite, and we can get a binary reward zero or one. Then how? Um, Along the lines of the of the last experiment, we can amplify that reward into a natural language, into a natural language reward using self-reflection. So uh, maybe these test cases, uh, test cases two and four failed because I forgot to check this at the end of the loop or something along the lines of that. Okay, and then we use that natural language reward uh, to aid the next function generation. And when all of the unit tests pass, then we um, then we classify our generation as as confident, and um, here we can see we 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 aren't accessing any ground truth um, unit tests unit tests or implementations, and so this is pass at one. This is pass at one accuracy, meaning the ability for the model a model to generate a um, to do a generation that it classifies as as confident. So um, here we can see in the top right. We actually we get uh, state of the art um, over all of, all other approaches um, on human eval Python, as well as a as a translated uh, human eval Rust uh, that we use with the series of, of compilers to um, generate the same same questions in Rust using a Rust compiler. Um, as well, uh, we generate we evaluated this framework on the code hard as well because uh, the GPT four paper. Uh, contain an evaluation as well. So we see significant progress over the seven and a half percent. Okay, and just to give credit there, um, the idea of self-generated tests uh, was done previously, probably by many works, but most notably by um, by uh, people at Microsoft on this code T, um, code T paper cited in, in the bottom left. Okay, let's move on to the last. Um, Last experiment, which was reasoning, and so reasoning is the hardest um, hardest task, most notably because, given a natural language sequence, how can we generate this binary reward? There's there's a lot of um, subjectivity that that um, is involved here, which makes it hard to generate this binary reward, and so given that, we we fall back to an external binary reward. And so we ask, we use exact match to generate a binary, a external binary reward. So if the answer is exact match with the correct grounded answer, then, then we give a one. Okay. And so this is a relaxation on the problem that is not consistent with the other two experiments. Um, well, the setup is, is other than that, the setup is uh, fairly similar given a task. Um, okay. It's not here in the graphic, but given the task, query a Wikipedia API. Um, so it's testing retrieval. Then it is using the React framework to think uh, and act and then act. And then we generate a completion. Then we evaluate that completion. We amplify that reward. And then we try again if the, if the generation was incorrect. OK, and so we show that reflection is fairly flexible. We um, use chain of thought as well as React for the generation framework. So how do we generate within a trial? How do we generate um, the, a completion? Okay, and so we see um, here in the top right, uh, this, this greatly influences um, a model's ability to generate a correct answer given that they can use an external binary reward. Okay, um, I'm going to skip over the, over the plot in the top right. Um, and if there's questions about that, I, I will be happy to answer them. Okay, so let, let's talk about some subtle details here that um, maybe clear confusion con confusion over confounding works as well as um, you know best practices for how to design um, systems that can autonomously learn from experience. Okay, so first is episodic memory enough for self improvement? And so let's define the episodic memory first. Episodic memory, um, in, in a sense, it's the traditional critique method. So um, given a given access to the previous generation. 
can we can we optimize that generation in order to do a better next generation? Okay, and so um, this more specifically is uh, we're omitted omitting self reflection, um, and we want to see if if this is enough. So can you just continuously ask? And this is more in in the lines of my my the example that I opened with. Can we simply do critique over and over again? Okay, well, we find uh, empirically no. So we can get better, better performance using this sort of iterative critique method. Um, but, but if we don't have the natural language reward, um, we, we miss out on, on uh, much, much more performance um, uh, in, in accuracy, given that we are not explicitly stating what can be done better in the next in the next generation, and so this is this is key here because the language models are reasoning in language space and not in semantic space, and so explicitly stating reasoning um, helps the model to do better reasoning in the future. Okay, and so um, let, let's talk about uh, programming as well, and so this was an ablation study we did wherein um, we want to compare this to. Um, more common um, self-debugging uh, frameworks. So given a generation and some sort of feedback from a unit test suite, how can we do better generation? Well, can, can you just ask it to self-debug itself given the unit tests? And so this has shown to work in, in, in practice, but we wanted to investigate, is this actually true for more complex tasks? And so we evaluate this Okay, so once again, um, okay, I, actually I skipped over this. We want to do two ablations. One, we want to remove the unit test suite. So can we just simply self-reflect? And this is more like a self-refine technique. And two, so that's self-generation, uh, test generation omission. And then two, uh, we can remove the self-reflection itself. So we are generating the unit test, but we have no way of specifying a natural language reward um, given that unit test feedback. And so that is self-reflection omission. Um, and we evaluate this on a very hard data set. So we take the hardest 50 problems from the Rust version of the human eval data set. So the hardest problems in probably one of the hardest languages. And we evaluate the performance and we see, let me move this. We, we see if we omit self-reflection, so we're doing self de a self-debugging framework, um, we don't actually get better performance. And so maybe the model is um, um, the model is unable to identify explicitly where the mistake is, and in turn, it's unable to optimize its its generation. And now, more interestingly, in the self in the test generation omission, um, we actually get worse results. And so, this could be due to hallucination that occurs using self-reflection that is not grounded on a binary reward. And so here we can see the two parts of having that binary reward first and then amplifying that binary reward to natural language is a powerful combination that is actually necessary for more complex, complex tasks. And uh, just for clarity, the base model here is GPT-4. Um, and all other results were run with GPT-4 as well. Okay, I believe that's the, oh, okay. Well, I, I put some bullet points down um, for more directions where I see the field moving. Um, and maybe these have been done in the past few days, uh, you never know. But um, uh, so first, um, there are various exploration techniques that exist. Um, some great works. I, I cited some uh, of my favorites down in the bottom, um, wherein there's various ways to explore. Uh, what I mean by ex exploration is um, how can you arrive at a correct generation? So various ways to do that. Um, but then I think the next questions are, um, how can we use memory better? So how can we store new ideas given that we put a lot of you know, maybe API calls towards um, more exploration. So how can we store those in, into memory and use those uh, in the future? As well as the idea that few shot dem demonstrations are very powerful, but they're obvious, um, often very tedious to craft. And so how can we um, use sort of these new memories 
learned from exploration? How can we turn those into few shots and do better? And the fourth point, transfer learning in, in semantic space over uh, examples that were not seen. And so I can open it up to question. I believe that's not. Uh, okay, yeah, and the references for, for this one. Great, thank you. It looks like we've got a question already, a uh, question from Yang Wenjun. Um, Yang Wenjun, feel free to come off, uh, off mute. Um, but we've got, uh, does it fine tune itself after reflection? Question. Uh, no, no. So in this work, uh, we didn't want to do any fine tuning. Um, and there are two, two reasons for that. One is practicality. Uh, we, we don't want to, uh, well, first, we did a lot of evaluation on um, GPT-4, so we cannot fine tune. Um, and then two, let's say we were able to fine tune. Well, the a slight subtlety here is that what reward do we fine tune with? And so we can use the binary reward. Um, but that's a relatively weak signal that we can um, that we can optimize for. And like a very concrete example is, let's say we uh, an LLM uh, jumps off a cliff or something, or gets hit by a car, and obviously that's a, that's a very bad sample. And so, um, if we were to generate a natural language, uh, let's say reward for that for that action, we could say never do this again. Uh, do not uh, you know, step in front of the car or something like that. And that's a very strong signal and that will highly influence a model's behavior in the future. But if we were to use a zero, okay, that's a bad, that's a bad action. And that's a very poor um, next optimization if we were to do, to do traditional fine tuning. Yeah. Great. Okay, so feel free to just uh, add a more question as well. Uh, maybe we can make it summarize the better sequence of actions to fine tune it. Um, yes, yes. So you can do um, some sort of supervised approach to, you know, given that you're putting up all this uh, upfront. Okay, and this is if I'm correctly understanding the question. Given that we are putting up all this upfront work on exploration, how can we sort of, let's say, distill the correct trajectory? And use that uh, within fine tuning. And so, yes, that is. Uh, I, I I'm not sure if anybody has done that before, uh, yet, but I'm sure somebody will. Um, wherein we're doing a uh, supervised approach for given these new explored correct trajectories. I got a question from Nicholas. Uh, are you using the initial prompt as short and long term memory? No. So. Um, Okay, so, um, well, the memory itself is is not um, involved with the prompt itself. So, so the memory is, is more of like a, a storage from given generations. And so uh, let's say the short-term memory is a, a, an explicit trajectory within a certain trial. So a sequence of actions, observations, um, and, and rewards. Um, and, and then the long-term memory is is a store of all of the natural language uh, rewards from from the model, and so I, I think more. Um, I think you're hinting towards uh, how do you generate? Are the prompts the same for the natural language reward model, um, and maybe the generator? Um, uh, no, they're they're different. Oh, I see here. Um, does it impact quality if you use? a smaller model to work. OK, so the question is, does it impact um, quality if you use a smaller model to reflect on a bigger one? Um, so let's say GPT uh, 3.5 Turbo reflects on GPT-4. Um, well, we didn't test um, various setups for different, um, let's say, different, uh, different models. Um, one thing, though, I uh, intuitively, I would, I would say that you want your self-reflector to be as strong as possible. Um, and the generator doesn't have to be as, as, as strong. So, so there's more, it seems like there, intuitively there's more of an influence on generating a correct self-reflection versus generating a good complete uh, generation. So, um, you know, if you have a very bad model, but you have a very, uh, a very bad generation model, but you have a very good evaluation model, 
let, let's use correct evaluations to do better generation. So would you say, um, is it better to say to use GPT 3.5 as the actor and GPT-4 as the self-reflector rather than vice versa in the same environment? Yeah, yeah. And and I think it, it makes sense intuitively. Like um, if you don't really care too much about uh, how well, how many times it takes for a generator to generate a correct completion uh, generation, but you do care if if the evaluation itself is 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 somewhat accurate. So, think, so GPT 3.5 will get there eventually. It may, it may not first time, but with enough self-reflection, it will be able to eventually find mm -hmm. the correct answer. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, that's obviously there's some sort of baseline for how well the evaluator has to be in order to do this. Um, because if your evaluator is you know 20% accurate versus 10% uh, accurate, then um, then maybe it won't make a difference. But you know, if your evaluator is at near 95%, then yes, you can afford for several mistakes. Cool. Uh, I've got another question from Yang Wenjun. Uh, is this able to do TD? I don't actually know what TD is. Um, Yang, can, if, you, um, if you're here, can you... In, in what sense? Um, can I speak or... Yeah, 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 of course. Um, so wait, wait a second. Let me move to the place. <laughs> Sorry, it's basically in in, term, in reinforcement learning, right? In just bit that um, you can how to say this. Uh, because you have the entitled that says it's uh, reinforcement learning through um, language model. It's kind of, I don't remember the exact name, but so, so by using temporal difference, you, you'll be able to, to um, tell like which action is better, I guess. I think so. That do you mean like optimizing the the kind of the Bellman equation? Yeah, yeah, kind of using, using the language model as a to evaluate the as basically a, an evaluation of the value of the state or something. Yeah, like yeah. That. So there's no value function or anything like that in in this in this uh, approach, right? Um. Yeah. Well. Okay. So value and reward sort of. Um, uh, sort of break down here uh, when we're talking in natural language space. Um, you could use a model itself um, to generate uh, values. Either those be um, those be scalar values and then amplified, or simply natural language values. Um, there are there there could be various uh, approaches to do that as well. But um, once again, when you're operating in natural language space, uh, the reward and uh, natural language reward and, and natural language value sort of break down. So. It seems seems like that your approach is more like uh, you, you put all the sequence into memory. Um, and do you like, you only put the, the best memory into the memory or just uh, all the, all the uh, like, uh, all the trials that you have done before into the memory? Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So um, there are various ways to do this. One is you can only store the most recent memory. So you want to put an emphasis on um, what was previously generated. Um, so, so that could be uh, one way to do it. Or, um, and in, we did this with Alphaworld, you can store, a, let's say, a hyperparameter of three past memories or five past memories. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, you could you could infer that maybe there is more emphasis on more recent memories in the way that it's uh, structured uh, in the memory, but uh, that is another way to to go about this approach. Yeah, the, the reason I'm, I, I bring up the the temporal difference on or like the Bauman equation, those kind of stuff, is because I I don't know if if this approach would actually uh, guarantee a somewhat uh, convergence toward the the uh, global maximum, mm -hmm. you know. Or it would just just uh, went through loops and loops and loops 
for uh, and trying to. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that, that you are correct. So um, we are trying to avoid hallucination here on generation, but you can infer. Well, we can hallucinate on the self reflections themselves, and that will lead. Uh, you know, it, it's like it, it's still a greedy approach, um, which can succumb to other either uh, local uh, local Ackman or or prob or even a worse st uh, state than before. Um, so yes, the, this this is not a uh, hallucination proof. If that's what you're hinting towards, right. um, meaning you won't always converge to the correct answer. Thank you, thank you. That, that's all I ask. Okay, we've got a question from Nicholas Johnson. Feel free to come up. Hey, sorry. Um, it's probably a dumb question. Um, I'm just wondering what what exactly um, does the memory look like. And the reason I'm asking is because I have a small robot project which is using text as a memory. So it stores, it can, it can like, um, you, one of the things the LLM, LLM can give you back is an instruction to update its initial prompt. Um, and um, I was just wondering how, I mean, what does, what does your memory look like given it's, this is GPT-3 and 4 um, and you obviously can't fine tune that or, mod or modify it in any way. Um, mm -hmm. What does what does the memory? Um, yeah, what what exactly is the memory for you? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a that, that's a very large question. And um, the reason why I say that is because um, we're using this memory to do better generation in, in the next trial. And so yep. the way that we sort of structure the memory is very important. Um, because one, these language models are reasoning in language base, but at the same time, sometimes, uh, you know, that that uh, assumption breaks down because maybe they're not reasoning. They're uh, simply following uh, you know, probabilistic templates from um, before, which can be stated in the memory. And so there are various ways to do this. I think the gold standard would be to um, use few shots as memory. So if you can, um, in your project, if you can find a way to um, sort of reword the, um, uh, okay, uh, no, uh, more, more simpler. Um, if you want to use an instruction um, that will optimize a prompt, um, you you can uh, explicitly state what has previously um, occurred in in the past generation first, um, as well as you need a uh, a hint for how to solve this problem better in the uh, in the future. So in our sense, um, let's take Alfworld for example. If a if an agent was wandering around um, around in the kitchen and was looking for a uh, let's say a spoon in the wrong place and it hallucinated hallucinated uh, over several actions. Well, one of the memories could look like, um, I, I tried to find a spoon in the cupboard, uh, comma, comma. Um, at, that was not the right place to look. In the next generation, I will look in the fridge because I noticed that I didn't explore that. Uh, or it could be along the lines of a better problem solving approach, such as I shouldn't check every location in the kitchen but maybe I will, um, I don't know, try to infer three reasonable locations first and then explore those. Um, so very open-ended, uh, various ways to do this. So, so the memory becomes part of the conversation history and then you modify that locally and also you, you wouldn't be sending back the same conversation each time. You're like, you're curating what you send back and having the other, having the LLM curate itself create its own conversation history? Yeah, um, sorry, I didn't get, uh, what was the question there? Sorry, um, it's, it's very hot. <laughs> um, so are, are, you, are, you, are you having the LLM curate its own conversation history? Like as you, as you ping it back and forth, you're pinging back a series of, like if, if it's hallucinated over something and it's, it, it's missed something, would you then go back and curate that history so to like prune out the junk so you mm. don't end up with a, a like a, a maxed out context window yeah yeah so so that's a good question um the um because in in our case uh, we're on the far end of the spectrum so we we, we take a conversation a probably um arbitrarily lar a long conversation and then we distill the natural language reflection from that conversation so we don't have any 
explicit dialogue actually present in the memory. But then um, on the other side of the spectrum is a, sort of the episodic memory um, case that I briefly talked about, which is we have the explicit conversation. And then somewhere, uh, somewhere in the middle, we have a, you know, a gap between maybe we only want the the good, um, the good uh, chats, or we can have a summary of the good chats as well as some explicit chats. Um, uh, there's various ways to uh, to fall on that spectrum. Thank you. Uh, let me go to follow up from Yang Wenjun. Uh, do, do you use a vector database to do that? Um, yes, so we don't use a vector database, um, mostly because we didn't have to. We didn't need, like, let's say 50 memories in order to solve a task. Um, but that is, uh, there, there was somewhere, so this, actually this work that I put, um, uh, the Voyager paper, they use a, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure they use a vector database in order to do a similarity search over, um, let's say, like lessons learned over time. Um, and so that's one way to extend this. Uh, approach into uh, let's say a, a more long-term um, Thomas framework in which you know you have some agent collecting experience uh, generating these natural language um, natural language experience histories storing those into a vector database and then uh, given a future task you can uh, retrieve a, a memory that is similar that is definitely one way to do it but we didn't use a vector db. And when you say similar would you say like how would you define how would they how would you define similarities? Is it like similar trajectories? Plus, like you're sort of yeah. doing similarity search over trajectories or, or what? Well, I mean, I, I think that there's like a you know a whole area of work uh, just on like retrieval. How how do you store and retrieve in the, in a good way? But I think um, one simplistic way uh, to do so would be let's say you you don't want to lose on explicit memory, um, but in the same in in the same um, in the same way, maybe the explicit memory um, alters your ability to retrieve uh, successfully at inference time. So um, how can we maintain a good balance? Well, you can store an explicit memory as well as use an LLM itself to generate, let's say, a description of that memory, a very abstract description. And then you can do similarity among, um, let's say, a given query of, of a memory that you want, and as well as the high level description of, of what that memory was. And then um, if if you can retrieve that rate, um, let's say that item, then you can access the explicit memory. Um, I have a couple of questions. So one thing you mentioned in the paper is that there was a difference between like code generation performance in Rust and Python. And like surprisingly, Python did worse on one of yeah. the data sets. I'm just interested in like, if you have any, like if you sort of managed to diagnose kind of why that happened. Yeah, so um, we saw, where was it? Here, you're, you're talking about uh, MVPP uh, Python. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so so we, so this was actually um, one of the only uh, benchmarks that, that um, sort of, we actually get worse results than GPT-4. And um, when we, Oh, I wish I had the the chart here. Um, when we when we looked into the results, um, we, we found that um, the ability to identify a correct implementation is extremely important. Um, in human eval, we, we were seeing somewhere along the lines of like ninety seven percent. So if if a completion was correct, um, how well can we identify that function implementation? Well, that is highly influ uh, influential on the overall ability for the model to um, uh, high, um, highly influential on the, the ability for the agent as a whole to solve that task. Um, and so for MBPP, I don't, I don't have the correct um, number off the top of my head, but I know it was significantly less than uh, human eval Python. So uh, given a correct function implementation, how well can we identify that uh, as, as a correct implementation? So this uh, falls more in terms of um, how well can you write uh, unit tests. Oh, so you're saying that the unit tests didn't really test the function, or that that the problem in the the problem was actually with the unit test generation step. Yeah, yeah, and so there are various ways to do this. We employed the the most simplest approach, which was um, 
generate a unit test suite first, and then that is a concrete unit test suite. We cannot alter it. So if it continues, uh, continually fails on one out of 10 unit tests, um, and that one unit test was actually wrong, well, then that is one error case uh, for, our, for our agent. Could you self-reflect on the unit test generation as well? Yeah, yeah. I think um, in general, I'm in general, you can probably get away with um, running a critique loop on every part of uh, the system. So you can highly scrutinize your unit test suite as well, um, maybe even individually as well, if, if you can afford that latency. Um, so let's say given a unit test suite of size 10 um, for each unit test, let's highly scrutinize one if, if it is necessary um, in terms of what it is testing. Two, if the unit test is actually correct, um, various ways to do that as well. Um, and then after, after you look through all of your unit tests, then hopefully you have a better unit test suite than before. Um, uh, one other uh, way to uh, sort of alleviate that process is that um, you can have this sort of um, um, minimal, uh, like minimal passing um, accuracy. So let's say 0 0.8. So if more than 0 0.8 of your unit tests pass, then you can classify that as a one in, within your binary reward. So there's various ways to uh, go about um, uh, failed unit tests, managing failed unit tests. Okay. Um, do we have any more questions? Okay. I mean, I've got one more question. Um, do you think we are with these kind of approaches on the route to AGI, or do you think they're fundamentally missing something? And if you think they're missing something, what do you think they're missing? Um. No, no, I, uh, no, this is not on the path. It, it's, it's not even on the path to AGI. Like, uh, even if we can have GPT-8, uh, I don't believe um, that is, you know, further along the path to AGI. Um, I, I was doing some testing yesterday on the, um, on the leak code hard uh, failed cases. Um, and so, okay, so there's several blocks here. One is, is um you know is it actually reasoning in language space um and and then two is reasoning in language space enough for agi well the the first case is i'm i'm sort of leaning towards um it's not actually reasoning in language space given this next token objective um and the reason why i say that is because i, I you know obviously this is very hand wavy but i was running some um, tests on the failed cases for leak code hard. And I saw that, so you're given a very hard programming problem, um, uh, leak code hard that, um, that was not seen. Um, so, so these are, are, uh, these are, uh, were created after the training of GPT-4. Um, given a very hard question, we can, we can take this, the ground truth solution, generate a natural language instruction on how to solve that problem specifically. And then let's give that to the model to see if it can just generate the code given that instruction. And now, so here we have all of the reasoning steps explicitly, explicitly defined. Yet when we run it um, using GPT-4, trying to generate the, the correct implementation. Um, okay, and also very hand wavy, but around 0 0.5, uh, percent of the time, it actually generates a wrong implementation. And it is not a syntactical error. So it's not missing a parenthesis somewhere, um, a, a closing parenthesis somewhere, uh, but the logic is correct. These are logical errors in which the code runs. So there's no runtime errors. But somehow, there is a logical error. Um, there are, There's at least one logical error that, that shows that maybe we're not reasoning uh, in language space. But this is quite a low percentage. You say zero point five percent. It will fail to follow the instruction or fail to oh, generate. Sorry, uh, um, fifty percent of the time. Um, fifty percent okay. of the time, given the correct reasoning trace, we can't decode that reasoning trace given this next token um, inference strategy, um, which makes it uh, extremely exponentially hard to do. 
uh, well, one to learn new, um, to learn to do better reasoning in general. Um, and then to new, uh, well, reasoning on, on new tasks in general, and then to better reasoning uh, strategies in general. So yeah, I, I'm not very, uh, not very convinced that this is on the path, uh, that this is AGI and then also on the path to AGI. Do you have any sense of why it's so performing so poorly at this task? Yeah. Um, ideally, we uh, it talks. Uh, it's more in lines of the what is the token space here? So here for Likud Heart, the the token well, well really GPT four in general. The token space is let's say maybe a word or most of a word, or maybe a number. Um, and so we're, we're trying to infer the next token over a very long sequence. Um, and so let's say there's a 0.99% uh, chance that you infer a productive next token. Now, if you compound that over 1,000 tokens or 10,000 tokens, now you can see how the, how the error compounds greatly. But if your token space is... Um, and again, this is only my view, but if the token space is more like these semantic ideas, so you infer next ideas in sequence, and you have a 0.99% chance of inferring the, the uh, a 99% chance of inferring the correct next idea, then maybe it doesn't matter how many tokens, if, you know, how many tokens, uh, traditional tokens that that generation uh, represents maybe there are only three ideas that need to be inferred 0 0.99 to the third um, that, that I think I think closing this gap between inferring next ideas and inferring next tokens uh, will be uh, very very important for um, uh, for doing better reasoning in general and, and also um, um, I think I lost my point. Um, anyway, I was talking about in uh, closing the gap between inferring next tokens and inferring. Oh yes, uh, sorry. The I do believe that um, as humans we auto regressively generate these ideas. Um, so in the sense that yes, this is like very human. Like if if you were to infer next ideas in sequence, and then maybe you inferred the wrong idea at step two, and you're now, you're now on step ten. Um, it does affect the way that you continue to reason. It's it, it, at least for me, it's the reason why I try to like clear my head of previous uh, you know problem solving approaches uh, completely, so that it's not affecting my my future um, uh, my future ideas. I think there have been some recent approaches which do something a little bit similar with like hierarchical transformers or hierarchical modeling, where they'll have mm -hmm. like a higher level next prediction, which is and then which will generate some state or some state in latent space. And then each of those kind of latent states is then decoded, I think, in parallel to tokens directly. Um, I don't know if there's any other things kind of sort of working with the kind of working towards kind of what you were describing. Yeah, yeah, I, I think um, it will be, there are some unsupervised approaches that are yet to be discovered that, uh, 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 need need to do this. Uh, need to do the 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 uh, various uh, unsupervised uh, unsupervised approaches that we don't have yet that we need, um, as well as once we have a model that can do this next idea generation, then let's use let's say GPT four itself to do the decoding. So um, given uh, sentences that all represent ideas that are um, you know maybe you don't know how sentence one, two, and three connect within each other, but then using GPT-4 itself to make that generation more fluent, I think that would be a, a promising approach. Um, like for example, when, you, when you're writing an essay, maybe you miss a period at the end of your sentence, um, but the idea of the sentence is, is correct. Or, or maybe you write two sentences in sequence, but it's not clear of how one sentence uh, connects, it transitions to the other. Well, you can use GPT-4 uh, to do that sort of transition. Um, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's promising when it's it's harder to when it's harder to transition 
than to put all the moving pieces on the table, um, more in lines of how we, how we generate our ideas. Great. Well, um, I think that's, that's cool at that. Thank you very much, Noah. That was um, brilliant.